First of all, thank you, uh, David, uh, for having me. And um, I'm just really, really delighted uh, to be here. Um, and people always say that. You know, they always say when they, you know, thanks so much, I'm so delighted to be here. But um, I really am um, because a lot of the kinds of uh, work which goes on here is the kind of work which I was re have really been interested in, involved with, uh, you know, for, for a long, long time. And it's really, really interesting to see that there is progress, that things do change over the decades, that questions which were just so not even on people's uh, horizons are, are now kind of central problems in a, in, in a um, research environment like this one. Um, and so actually, most of what I'm actually going to talk about um, really is actually uh, uh, really old work. Um, and the reason why I thought perhaps that was relevant is because, you know, I keep up a bit. And um, I think that still there's a, a number of, of different um, kinds of observations which were made in that old work which might be uh, uh, useful or interesting to you if I uh, 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 pull, it, pull it together. Um, so um, the first thing I thought I'd do here a little bit um, was I sort of say, sort of say this backstory of, of, of my own story a little bit, um, basically because um, when I started working many years ago, actually, I was working on story understanding uh, and story structure. And this work actually is some of the oldest work wh which, which I did. Um, but what was interesting to me is that, and I'll, I'll point out a little bit where some of those, uh, some problems in this kind of analysis came in, which sort of led me to the next piece of work wh which I did. Um, which was to develop a, a general purpose uh, uh, linguistic model of the structure of discourse, um, which um, is basically uh, the semantics of which have basically been uh, developed in, uh, in SDRT. And um, so that work was really, as I say, a, a general purpose uh, linguistic theory of discourse. Um, and after a, a while, um, uh, I, became to be, I became interested in some other, uh, other things which I've been doing a bit more, more recently, uh, uh, looking at the linguistic structure of arguments. Uh, essentially a bit in, the, in that model and also look at doing some work on, on sentiment analysis. And sort of through all of this work, which for me one thing sort of leads quite uh, uh, naturally to another, I've also been in another number of different um, uh, institutional uh, environments, uh, either at universities, uh, corporate research labs, uh, uh, contract research labs, and now a, a, a startup, uh, and the, the startup which I was involved with uh, was a natural language search startup called PowerSet, which was uh, uh, using the uh, natural language processing uh, capability that was developed at Xerox PARC. Um, and um, that company basically uh, was then acquired by Microsoft. Uh, and so now I'm actually part of Bing, uh, which is Microsoft's search engine, which is kind of a funny place to go, uh, a funny place to be. So, um, uh, so one reason I want to tell you the story is that many of you are very young people, and um, I just I think it's sometimes interesting when you're very young or beginning your career to have some idea <laughs> about how did people get to where they were and also what kind of trajectories careers can take. So that's a little bit why I told you a little bit about that. Uh, and also, uh, I'm very prone to interruptions and resumptions and pushing and popping, uh, which is actually the work, uh, a, a lot of what I introduced uh, actually into discourse analysis 
and um, so there'll be a lot of that going on anyway. So you might as well have the backstories so you can understand something. And basically, what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about story structure uh, and constraints on storytelling, and then just finish up just a little tiny bit when I call it stories across time and space, uh, uh, talking essentially about uh, some uh, cultural aspects of storytelling, which I, I really didn't necessarily ex intend to talk too very much about. Um, and then I was here yesterday looking uh, at, on the visitor's tour, and it seemed that actually uh, considering a lot of the projects that are going on, thinking also about some of these more cultural aspects is uh, uh, interesting. Um, so essentially, the, the, this is the, a bit of the text that I, I want to work with. Um, this is a children's book, uh, and this is the beginning of it, and it's called The Bouncy Baby Bunny Finds His Bed. Um, another reason I wanted to deal with this is because actually I've been working on this text for decades, and actually even today I actually, I get, I actually realize that I actually knew the answer to something that has been in fact bothering me for many, many years. So every time I, you return to a really rich data set, you always, I think, get, um, get, get insights. Um, but anyhow, uh, so this is, a, this is the story. Every morning, the bouncy baby bunny had fun playing with his brothers and sisters. The bouncy baby bunny was always the first one to tumble into their hotel, for, uh, into their hole for an afternoon nap. But one afternoon, the bouncy baby bunny couldn't get to sleep. He fidgeted and fudgeted until thump, he kicked his brothers and sisters out of bed. The other rabbits didn't like it. They said crossly, go and find someplace else to sleep. So that's the beginning of it. And uh, we'll be sort of, I'll be sort of using uh, some of the text for, from this, uh, from the rest of the story as, as we go on. Um, so something I know that you all know here, um, stories are universal. They're found in all cultures and all languages. Um, the thing which I find interesting is that they have astonishing, they display astonishing structural similarity across language, cultures, uh, time, and space. And I'm really using, I'm really taking the word structural similarity here. Um, and the, then we'll talk a bit about what are the kinds of structures that I, that I really have in mind. And when I actually talk about time, um, actually sort of saying that some of the earliest uh, uh, texts that I've dealt with um, were like Hittite texts, and they were completely, absolutely normal in terms of story structure, uh, you know, things that are. Uh, so, uh, so this is, this was um, uh, the level at which I want to then talk about it. And uh, the two kinds of things, and really it's going to be the basis, uh, the, most of the talk there is the question of what a story is and how are stories structured. Now, um, I'm going to give a, a particular uh, definition of a story, um, and I think it's actually a, a, a rich enough and strong enough definition um, that it, it, it gives rise to uh, the ability to, to, to think about uh, a number of important issues. Um, so basically, the way I'm defining a story is a, as a specific pastime narrative uh, which makes a point. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go through and talk about each of these dimensions uh, of, of stories, uh, how, they're, uh, uh, how they're expressed and deployed, and um, uh, what are the implications uh, uh, of this. So the first thing I, I want to say is we're, talking, we're saying that stories are specific. There are narratives that aren't specific, but stories are specific. And um, so I'm really sort of taking, I mean, sort of saying, well, how to, how to get that across. Just think about narrative films. Just think about, you know, so you've seen this a million times, okay? The first thing that happens is there's a big opening shot, right? And it's like the hills and the sea. And then, then essentially you sort of get something closing in a little bit. Maybe you see a... Um, a city or a, a town on a hill, and then you realize, no, this is not probably taking place in Paleolithic time. You know, this may be, you know, take, but perhaps it could be taking place any time, let's say, between the 18th century and now, okay? You just sort of see that city on the hill, 
Um, and then you go and you see people sort of bustling about, right? Um, you're sort of closer in. When you see the people bustling about, you begin to know what time frame we're in, right? You see the clothes. Uh, you sort of say, oh, I see where this basically is in Europe. It's, it's not in the Middle East. It's basically um, in the, uh, um, you know, the, whatever it is, the 1890s. It's not in 1930. Um, and then one of the things that, that you often will, ha will see the camera may focus in suddenly on, on one character, one person. Maybe it's gone. Maybe it's gone and looked at a number of people. So you begin to get some general idea, and then suddenly you've got it really focusing in uh, on one character, sort of perhaps beginning to follow that character through the crowd. Um, and I don't know what happened to the rest of it, um, but um, oh, I know. I've got an example here. So essentially, this is what's going on here, right? Every morning, the bouncy baby bunny had fun playing with his brothers and sisters. The bouncy baby bunny was always the first one to tumble into their hole for an after, uh, afternoon nap. This is what generally happens with this specific character. Okay? But then what happens essentially is there's something we think of as the first real specific event of the story. And that's when time starts. That's when we begin to get that feeling in the movie of, Okay, now it's really begun. Now we just haven't gotten all that general stuff. Now we're really in somehow the story proper because specific time has really begun. And this is what happens here. But one afternoon, and suddenly we're at a specific time point, and what's hap going to happen now is going to be time progressing from that time point. And the first event that we really get, these are, this is the first. This is basically that we have uh, a particular uh, uh, time frame. So we're in a specific, uh, you know, we've begun time here. And this is the first absolute event. So there was a kind of fidgeting and fudgeting that was taking time, place over time. But now we basically get one particular um, uh, event. And at that moment, uh, we're really in the story. So. There are generic narratives. They always, uh, uh, that, that, that tell you what always happens. But somehow, those are descriptions. They're narrative descriptions. We don't have the feeling that they somehow are, are stories. Now, um, uh, I don't know. I think I, didn't, I should have taken these two out because they're the same things. So here, basically, what happens is, we have a specific bunny in a specific time in some kind of specific location. The and that's really the story world, which is different, essentially, than some general descriptive world in which uh, that, um, uh, that bunny might, uh, might exist. We have time really begun. Um, now, stories then are past time narratives. Now, there are present time narratives where we have events in time. Um, for example, simultaneous, um, simultaneous narration in which the timeline is ma mapped on to the time of utterance. Um, again, those aren't, those aren't stories. We also have narratives of future events like plans in which we have timelines of events which are projected to occur in the future. But again, they're something different. So stories take place in the, in the in the past, even science fiction stories, for example, which take place in some putative future, they're actually recounted from an even more uh, remote future as we look back on, on things wh which happened. And there's some very real reasons having to do with the fact that stories uh, uh, have to make a point, and we'll talk a bit more about that, that sort of forces this constraint. Now, um, in narrative, and I think many of you are by now, because these things have become very well known. Um, there's a sequential ordering of events in the text, which determine uh, the order in which they're to be interpreted. Um, the first time I ever encountered this kind of thing was in the work that Lubov and Wolecki did in the late 60s. Um, and since then, there's been essentially 
uh, a whole really important body of work, particularly in formal semantics, which is really, really dealt with, with this kind of, of uh, observation. So narratives then uh, are basically lists from a discourse uh, parsing perspective. Really, all they are is a list uh, of, of events. And these clauses are then have these particular properties of being instantaneous, non-iterative, uh, non-habitual. And they are things that are encoded essentially on the main line of the, of, uh, of the sentence. And they actually, they actually function then to, to create a main discourse line, a main uh, uh, topic line uh, uh, of the, of the uh, text itself. Um, so if you basically have something like, uh, um, so basically what uh, the observation really comes with, like if you have something like he was sitting down, okay, one of the things that can happen is that, that that's really defining essentially um, an interval of time. Now if you have he sat down, it's as if it happened instantaneously. Now the event in the world isn't an instantaneous event, but one of the things is it creates essentially Linguistically, it creates essentially a punctual event. So um, it's not really saying something about the nature of the world. It's actually just saying something about the nature, the way that lingu language uh, 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 encodes these things. And languages tend to have all kinds of markers, for example, that so we'll say sort of this took place over time or this took place instantaneously. Uh, and as I say, it's, a, it's this idea of perhaps Punctual is a better word, or uh, you know, sort of saying, okay, you can put a stake in the ground at this point, rather than sort of saying it, it extends across across um, across time. Uh, and um, so here really is the first event, um, and this event is this fidgeting and fudgeting really is this taking place across some period of time. But then suddenly there's this thing that happened. He kicked and uh, threw them out of bed. Um, now, um, so what they do is, they, they're, when you have a sequence of these kinds of clauses, uh, they encode essentially, this is the time, I don't know, the timeline uh, of, the, of the narrative. You sort of, so this is the first thing that happened, he kicked him out of bed, and the next thing that happened is um, he went and found someplace else to sleep. So that's basically, and this is encoded in this funny kind of way, where basically you have to take the, you have to get this interpretation of the, of the did by going inside an oblique context, in this case, this reported speech context, and taking it out and putting it on the main timeline. And the next thing is that happens is you get uh, uh, this uh, event, uh, this next event, which is encoded in this funny kind of way because it's a, a children's uh, story of. So that's what happened. He kicked his brother and sister out of bed. Uh, they said, go um, find some place else to sleep. And then he had this other, then he, he had this other problem. Um, why, the, why he found a, a Beaver, Beaver's home isn't just because of some things having to do with the rest of the story. Um, so, so there we have essentially this kind of simple kind of idea. But, um, Narrative timelines can be embedded in other lines. For example, in this case, what we have essentially are, is, a, is a, a flashback, which itself is a, is a narrative line. Um, and then we can also have other discourse contexts, which can be embedded in them. For example, here what we have is this kind of pull-out meta-commentary uh, to a modeled reader by a modeled writer saying, don't, please don't forget something that existed. Uh, pointing back essentially into the text, and then you can uh, return or pop here. So essentially, this business of pushing and popping, and uh, is this on the timeline? Is it not? Gee, why isn't it? Um, actually, is what led to the development of, of uh, the linguistic discourse model, which was uh, uh, at the time uh, when it was developed, um, uh, Gross and Seidner were interested in thinking about. Uh, about uh, a, a more kind of uh, psychological uh, uh, intent-based uh, notion, but I was really interested in essentially a very structural and linguistic notion 
of uh, what the structure what what the structure is, and and that led uh, to uh, all kinds of things having to do with discourse trees and how they worked and stuff, which has been taken up in, in other other work uh, by other people. Um, okay, what happens next? Oh, something happened. Okay. Um, so this basically just says you can pop. That's all it says. Um, now, so there we have these stories. So they're specific past time. We see their narratives, and they make a point. And um, so the, the thing is, you, you tell stories essentially. You know, stories basically, when you're telling a story essentially, in a, especially in a conversation, but in general, what they do is they create essentially there's some kind of situation in some kind of modeled world which uh, is created through language or if it's film, created also through film or some other method, uh, 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 symbolic representation um, that basically illustrates some kind of, of specific situation in that world which makes essentially a general point in the world that's uh, shared with the, with the recipients. And sometimes that's called the moral, sometimes it's called the takeaway of the story. Uh, we can think of it as, a, as the, the point of, uh, of the story. Um, and so the question is, how do we know what the point of a story is, and, and why does that matter? So why do you have to make a point when you tell a story? Well, this observation, um, uh, comes, as I said, this is old work, comes from uh, uh, putting together some kinds of work that was done by, uh, by Lebov on storytelling together with work that came out of, of uh, uh, conversational analysis, um, particularly really the work uh, that Sachs, of Sachs, mm. perhaps more than the, than the work of Sachs and Shegloff, but really this kind of ethnomethodological work. So the thing is, when somebody starts to tell you a story, like in a conversation, what happens? Well, what happens is that the speaker has basically signaled that they're going to, to be taking up the floor for rather a long period of time. You're not going to have that normal back and forth turn exchange that you're used to in a conversation. And what the recipient basically has to do is do two things, one, both of which, if you think about it, have quite a high social cost. One of which is he has to shut up and listen. And the other thing is has to react appropriately, okay? both as the story goes on and at the end of the story. So it is basically inappropriate at the end of somebody telling you a story that was intended to be a long, sad story for you to laugh. It's also inappropriate for you basically to pick out some random thing in the middle of the story and sort of uh, focus on that. Of course you can, but what does it do? I mean, that's basically is a way that uh, uh, you certainly, you're either really insulting the speaker by saying, you know, what was that? I didn't even care or you're showing yourself to be an idiot. So in both cases, that's not something you want to be doing. So essentially, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of work that the recipient needs to be doing. So storytelling is fraught, okay? It's dangerous in a way. So a teller then has to do something to, to basically pay the recipient for all the, for, uh, to reward the recipient, let's say, for, for, for what kinds of uh, situations that recipient has been in. And so there's a couple of, um, of them, one of which is uh, structuring the telling so recipients know what happened, when and why, and that's basically what, what happened when is what's, giving, what's being given essentially by that timeline. Um, and um, and then, then we'll get to what these other other things are about, what these other constraints are and, and how they interact. So one of the things is, is when you're telling a, a story, um, there's a, a very, very uh, positive constraint essentially to tailor the story to the people who are being told that story on a specific, at a specific moment. 
Um, that's in a conversation. Now, obviously, when you write a book or you make a film or you make, let's say, a public kind of story, what you're doing is you're, you're modeling your recipient, okay? You're modeling a general kind of recipient. Um, and one of the things, of course, about a story told in a, in a book or a film, if you see it again, you may read something else into it, but the story itself hasn't changed by the fact that you've, you've watched it. But that's not the case, essentially, uh, in conversational stories, which people are very aware, essentially. Uh, it's sort of social appropriateness tells them, don't bore these people because they're going to have to shut up till you finish. So tell a story that somehow uh, 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 takes those people into account. So you see this kind of thing. If people tell the same general kind of story to several different kinds of people, you may have slight, slight um, tuning, slight modification. This is something which I think you know, has some rather direct kind of um, applicability to the uh, cross-cultural kinds of contact situations that you're involved in modeling here. Um, so for example, um, you might have a story in which um, uh, you're talking about a group of people and you know that um, that the child of one of the people you're talking to, you know, just won a beauty contest. And then you might talk, say, mention of, about a particular uh, a character in the story. Of course, she's not as beautiful as your daughter is, or she's uh, something like that. So essentially, where you, you basically address some of, the, some of the concerns, and it's very often the case that you omit information, okay? That, you know, you know that people have had a tragedy, lost a child. Okay, if it's not really important in your story to have that child do something cute, maybe you just take it out. Okay, because there's this kind of display of sensitivity that people do. Um, so basically, that involves modeling the listener's knowledge and knowledge state, uh, interest, and sensibility in how you tell your story. And this other idea is you want to locally occasion the, the telling. This is something that's also, I think, uh, you know, something important as you're thinking about, um, about interactive environments, um, that you have to integrate this story comfortably into the flow of the conversation. That, what that really means is that the events the, and states, the point of that story somehow should relate to the concerns being expressed in the conversation itself. So basically, again, you're telling a big chunk of stuff. It's not, doesn't really, um, uh, it's not really um, a good idea. Basically, people are having a little, you know, back and forth conversation, and suddenly you t start talking, telling the story about, you know, what happened to you Thursday at the baseball game. Now, you may want to do that, but if you do want to do it, what you normally do will be to apologize for it. Okay? You'll say, I know this is off the point, but. Okay, so where does that come from, this being off the point, but stuff? It comes essentially out of this kind of constraint uh, to uh, locally occasion your, your telling. And these, these terms, recipient design and local occasion, locally occasion and where, what, they, what they resulted, you know, what they really uh, involve, really come um, from the work of, uh, of, of sex and, and uh, some of you may be familiar and some not. Um, now, this is just an, an interesting thing that comes out, is that you can't tell exactly the same story or tell the, tell the same story exactly the same way um, to, this, to the same person because obviously their knowledge state uh, has been changed. So one of the things is because of the need to locally occasion in recipient design, and the inability to tell the same story to the same person twice, um, you will never actually get exactly the same telling. Um, so here's structuring the telling. Um, so basically, a basic narrative, according to, to uh, very reductionist uh, narrative analysis that sort of, sort of started with prop looking at the structure of, of, of uh, Russian folk tales in terms of a, a sequence of, of stereotypical kinds of relationships or actions of particular uh, types of stereotypical characters, um, that actually ended up being sort of very succinctly uh, 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 
summarized as saying what was called lac lac liquidated. I always thought maybe that sounded better in some other language like French or Russian where it actually came from. But um, what it means is there's some kind of, pro of situation, um, perhaps a problem, perhaps actually even a good situation, um, and then something happens and that particular situation uh, changes. And that's basically the, the basic narrative structure. And that's sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's more, the more elaborate is this more kind of well-known Aristotelian kind of idea of setting some kind of action, some kind of climax and resolution, uh, and then perhaps some kind of coda that ties things together. But this is really, um, and this when you, you know, you don't necessarily get this kind of thing uh, if you look at stories from all kinds of stories. Uh, you do always find this one. Um, so essentially you have this event structure then that tells you exactly what happened when. Uh, and then you have all the other stuff, okay? All the other stuff that tells you uh, all kinds of state of information, non, uh, not iterative information, uh, non, sorry, non-narrative information, things that happened about the characters, the settings, motivations, things that happened more than once habitually or so on. So there's a lot of other stuff. Okay, so you've got all these events and you've got all this other stuff, okay? And somehow together they're expressing that there was some kind of lack and that got li liquidated. Um, and um, so the lack, essentially, the situation that needs changing is expressed essentially in all of this kind of, of information. And um, in, a, uh, in this more Aristotelian thing, you have the setting, the resolution, and the coda. They tell you all this stuff about, about this. Um, and the event structure, essentially, I have a little thing there. The, 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 the um, evaluation, the, sorry, the event structure, essentially, uh, especially the one particular event, is what essentially moves you from a state of this lacking to the other side, to this liquidated side. And that's essentially that you have essentially this action and this climax uh, which actually changes, changes some key aspects, essentially, of the world, the story world, before they happened. Um, and um, so, I don't know why I put this slide in, but anyhow. Um, uh, so what had happened here is you had the, the bouncy baby bunny, we had him on the first slide. Uh, he got kicked out of his home. Um, and he's wandering around feeling very sad. Uh, but at that very moment, back in the borough, his brothers and sisters were wishing the same thing. A mean old skunk had come along and turned them out. This is my hole now, said that pesky skunk. He rolled himself up into a tight little ball. You won't forget this, will you? And then next to no time, he was fast asleep. Um, so essentially, what's happened here in the story world is that the bouncy baby bunny created this very difficult situation. But the difficult situation has come along that the, the, bounce, the babies, the, the brothers and sisters have lost, uh, lost their home and the bouncy baby bunny is out wandering in the world feeling very sad. So that essentially is uh, the situation, the lack that basically this story is going to revolve around. Um, so, so the real question um, that I'm asking then is you've got all this stuff, right? You've got all these events. You have all of this stuff coming in and out and whatever. And actually, uh, yesterday during the, um, uh, during the tour, um, I noticed something. So there was something which happened. Um, I guess it was, it was the accident scene, I guess, that was in Bosnia. Um, and, you know, you have the, the child lying there in the, the, the truck. And then there's this idea, essentially, about, well, what is it um, that when, the, when the, uh, the military person says what happened, what is, 
a reasonable thing to reply because all kinds of things happened. Right? And that's exactly the, the same kind of situation which we have happening here in a, in a story like this, the Bounty Baby Bunny. We have all this stuff happening, all this information. Okay? But, the pro we, but because it's a story, and imagine it's a conversational story for that moment, the recipients have this real problem. They have to know how to react. They have to know what was important in all of this information that they were told. So how does that happen? How do they know that they should react to this particular thing rather than that? Because just think about, an, you know, you have stories where basically said, you know, you know, let's say, you know, so I came home from work, you know, I put down my bag, I went to the, to the mailbox and something happened and this and that and the other thing. Well, it turns out that what, you know, what it's really about is that some terrible thing happened when I made dinner. It really doesn't have to do with the mailbox. It doesn't have to do with the fact that somehow the, the, the teller had to get me from the mailbox into the kitchen. Okay? Some events are more important than others, and some, essentially, some kind of states are more important than others. And how does that get, get, get um, uh, figured out? So basically, uh, recipients evaluate information. They basically give a weight to their information so the recipients can know how to react. And not all the information is equally relevant. Um, so basically, tellers accord each proposition in the story um, a degree of salience that reflects the importance um, of, this, uh, of its importance to the story being told. And what that really means is, is that your story recipient is sitting there keeping track, essentially, of the weights that, is, that are associated with these various piece, pieces of information. Okay. Well, how do they assign that salience? Um, they, encode, they mark that salience uh, by uh, some kind of adjustment in the encoding form of the proposition that allows it uh, to be to stand out, if you will, from its immediate neighbors. Now, when Lebov was first working on this, he had the idea that there were certain things which he called evaluative devices. So there were things that that somehow there were these rhetorical forms, which by themselves basically mark salience. Sometimes people think that that uh, reported speech does that, but think about a story like. You know, so Mary said, no, Joanne said, then Mary said, then Joanne said. Reported speech cannot mark salience in the he said, she said story, right? But then let's say, so, so Mary said, so John said, so Mary said, so John said, so then Peter walked in the room and, and then suddenly what's evaluative in that is that you basically uh, have, have changed from a reported speech to a, um, to a, uh, a declarative kind of sentence. So basically, just thinking, and this I know is something that, that, that you all know, um, and that's one reason why, as I say, it's, it's, it's delightful to be here because many years ago, people didn't know any of this. Uh, the idea, essentially, that there's all of this kind of stuff that's going on uh, in any utterance, right? And you all know that. So, so basically, Let's say I want to assign salience to something, and I can, I'm going to assign salience by, um, by changing or, or modifying the encoding form of a particular proposition from its neighbors. And I can do that along every level, right? I can do it prosodically. I can do it gesturally. I can do it by performing, by enacting. But let's say I've been doing a lot of moving around, I can suddenly become very still. It's the differential that's going to mark the salience, not the, not the thing itself. So it could be prosodic, it, it could be performative or prosodic or gestural, it could be phonological, you could suddenly extend words out, you could basically start using some kind of, uh, of accent, or you could stop using an accent. Could, um, I always forget what the morphological one is, and it comes back to me later. But syntactically, you could have long sentences and get a short sentence, or you could get a short, have a lot of short sentences and then suddenly get a long sentence. Okay? Um, you can use discourse embedding. 
uh, for example, that's what we sometimes call, you know, delaying, an, you know, anticip building anticipation by essentially uh, having some kind of digression and then coming back. Right? Um, uh, and you can do it essentially in the interaction by, you know, saying, isn't that the way these things always are? Or you remember that, John, or something like that. So you essentially have all of these different types of, of um, resources, which are the resources that are available to you in encoding any utterance at any time, but you can mark any one of them. You can basically change any one of them. And the degree of salience that a particular proposition is going to be uh, accorded really is going to depend essentially on how it's differentially marked from uh, other information. Uh, there's one other here, which is an interesting one, which is repetition, because there you can have something repeated and that also um, uh, you know, calls attention to itself by the repetition, but sometimes you get all kinds of repetitive stuff and suddenly you get something that is really unexpected. So essentially, it's this difference. Okay? And what you have is something which is being computed online by the recipients, and that essentially uh, is going to allow them to, to know what to pay attention to, or what to okay? So now, both events and this durative descriptive, all this other set, set situation is evaluated. And what's interesting then is when you look at it, it turns out that the most highly evaluated state, that is this durative description, non-event stuff, um, captures the lack, it captures the problem. And the most highly ev evaluated event information is the information that causes that shift. Okay, so that's a, a kind of, um, uh, for me, kind of magic thing and also, um, was when I first noticed it and has been for subsequently kind of scary. And it was also scary for me um, because at the time I was thinking about this, um, people did not, for example, have an idea of, we're not looking at, they weren't looking at text at all, but they certainly were not thinking about um, some parts of text being weighted differently or any kind of information uh, uh, weighting or how that would work. And this essentially, uh, uh, would re relied on uh, a set of ideas about cognitive processing, which were not really around. Um, so, you, uh -huh. that's TV news. Uh, you give uh, more examples about the relationship between feelings and the perspectives. Excuse me. Uh, can you give more examples about the relationship of feelings and the perspectives? Of of saliency and the perspectives. Of salience and syntactic. Yes. Um, well. Yes. I think the thing about, the, about it is that, um, for example, well, um, uh, there's actually a novel that's called, uh, I think it's A High Wind in Jamaica, um, which, um, in which most of the sentences are syntactically very complex. Okay, they have embedded clauses. Uh, and the key event in the story, the thing which changes the world, is in a four-line sentence in, with a simple an, uh, event, which the child falls out of a tree and dies. Okay? So essentially, what you have there is you have this syntactic complexity, and then what's important, what really catches your eye, is something which is expressed essentially in uh, in, in a way that is, is syntactically very different from its neighbors. So the real point is, is that you're always looking and seeing what, are the, what, what is the encoding norm of the text at any given time, because that's dynamically changing as you go through a text. So it's pretty much around in that neighborhood, what's gone on and how does that differ? So that was one, so essentially you can have something like, um, uh, uh, like embedding, you could have something where suddenly you, um, you, um, you front something, for example, okay? Um, and it, lexically, of course, lexi the lexicon is the other one that I forgot. Maybe I meant that with morphology. But um, so uh, with the lexicon, 
you can very, you can do all kinds of you can also do all kinds of things like what kind of lexical item you pick. So do you pick essentially uh, a uh, uh, a slang expression will stand out, if you will, in a formal text. A formal expression will stand out in a in a, in a, a slang text. Okay, so so again, what you're doing is looking essentially um, at if you look at the syntax. Okay. You're sort of saying, okay, this, these sentences um, are, you know, it's, it's really syntactically simple, syntactically complex. Uh, suddenly I've got this fronting. I don't know why it is the person, but suddenly somebody fronted something. Suddenly you have a, a passive where, um, where all the rest of the sentences have been active. Um, you could have um, um, a periphrastic genitive, where you would be used to an inflected genitive, for example. Um, so there are all those kinds of, 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 uh, of choices uh, that, that can work. Yeah, I think that that's exactly what you would do. Um, and, um, and though, um, you know, though this um, parts of this model have been, you know, implemented over the years in various kinds of ways. Now, um, certainly, as far as syntax is concerned, you have, you know, take, you know, take a, uh, a, a, a you know, in a way, since we're actually, it's interesting because since in a way, since we're dealing with difference, if you will. Um, you could use all different kinds of parsers, which would do things essentially even at different levels of complexity and whatever. And probably certain things are going to show up in one, and you know, many things are going to show up, I think, in a, using a very simple parser, uh, that there would be a difference. But some things you may want need to look at something more, more complex. Um, so that's, I think, the way that, um, uh, that you do it. Um, um, so. You know, this is a this is an, a very important sentence, a very important event. It isn't the key event, but it's a very important event in the story, because what happens is is that the skunk rolls himself up into a ball, and then what's going to happen is, it's physics, that the bunny who got kicked out of the last house he was in rolls down the hill, bangs into the skunk, and pushes him out of his home. Okay. So the rolling up is very important. And um, so essentially, um, this is a children's story. And we're not usually getting as much modification here. So that's just another syntactic one. Could be letter, le level of modification uh, of a particular um, uh, 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 noun or verb or something. So here we have this ball. And suddenly, it's a tight little one. We haven't had that. that we haven't had essentially, if you will, uh, uh, an adjective, an adverbial uh, uh, modifier of, of, of a noun anyplace else really in this story. Um, and then what we have is we have this you know, excursion out into the world, and we haven't had that either. Okay? Now, we get that a couple of times, but each time it's pretty uh, it's special in its, uh, in its own constraint, uh, circumstance, but that's the first time we have it. So what that does is it sort of tells you I better do just what the author told me, and I better remember this, because this is going to be important. Um, um, now, this is where the baby, bouncy baby bunny kicks his brothers and sisters out and makes them mad. So we have onomatopoeia. We basically have um, uh, this thump is actually the way that they're encoding uh, this kicking event. So this kicking event actually is subordinated uh, to that thump. Um, so, um, and then we essentially have, a, we have a reporting of an internal state of, of a character, which we haven't had before, okay? Everything has been essentially omniscient character, but from the outside, we haven't seen inside anybody's, anybody's uh, heart before. Um, and then we get this kind of um, uh, uh, direct speech, we get essentially this even this is sort of syntactically more complex than, than, than what we've seen. So we've got a lot of things that are basically um, uh, telling us that this kicking thing is really important. Um, so 
So here we go. Out, this is the bouncy baby bunny. Out of the hollow log he rolled, and he went roly-poly over faster and faster all the way down the hill. So we know this is really important because we've gotten all kinds of modification, essentially, of this rolling event that we haven't had before, until with a wish and a whoosh, he shot right through his own front door, and with a wish and a whoosh, that pesky old skunk who was still curled up in a tight little ball, you didn't forget that, did you, was shot right through the back door. He rolled down the hill and ended up in the middle of a bramble bush. Now, the pesky old skunk, okay, being shot straight through the back door, through its action, is what essentially is the key event which essentially restores happiness uh, to the bouncy baby bunny and his brothers and sisters, okay? And um, uh, so remember, one of the things that was going on was that the rabbits didn't like it uh, because the bouncy baby bunny was uh, being such a pest. So that was one of the lacks in the world. And, um, and then he was very sad about what happened. And here the brothers and sisters essentially are incredibly glad to see him, okay? So we have the resolution of the problem essentially through this, through this kicking. Um, and um, we, we could go back and look at it um, for a second. Um, so when we look at this text, and when we look at many texts actually, um, it can be really scary to see that if you, you know, it, that the evaluation, the saliency marking piles up at this point. Now this was uh, also observed um, um, some years ago um, by Bob Longacre when he was looking at stories. And he was, uh, he's an SIL, uh, uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics, uh, 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 was a, a researcher, a discourse researcher from there uh, in the uh, years ago. And uh, he was looking at um, stories from all over the world, and he was getting the same kind of pileup, okay? Um, and so what do we have here? We have, we have a wish and a whoosh, which is onomatopoeia, which we had from earlier. So basically, we've had that before, but it's brought into play again, and essentially a repetition of it, which we haven't had, had there. We had pesky which essentially is a low frequency item because this is a book that's like for kids from three to five years old. And pesky is a low frequency item for them. We get the repetition, we get essentially this not forgetting thing back again. And all of this essentially is modifying what's going on here, bringing our attention to the fact that this is what we're supposed to remember. And this is essentially what uh, what gets rid of, as I say, the, the key problem. So one of the things that we will say are, you know, we, we, we started saying it, and, you know, and I, yesterday in the demonstration, there was this nice quote from, from Ursula Le Guin about um, uh, that stories are universal and all cultures have them, and they do, okay? Now, if you think about it, these kind of interactive constraints are also universal. So when I'm talking about structural constraints and structural information being uh, universal, you, you know, you're sitting around the campfire there, wherever you are, and you can't tell a dumb story. You lose face if you tell a dumb story, and that's true anywhere, okay? Just think, of, for example, of the, uh, you know, the people don't like to be bored. They don't like to have their time wasted. We have essentially a lot of information about good storytellers, whether they're in Hollywood um, or whether they're um, uh, in uh, a small face-to-face -face community having, having high uh, social value. And, but you have to tell that story so that people understand what it's about, okay? They have to understand what it's about, what happened, why it happened, and what they're supposed to make about it. Now, this at, linguistically, they're also essentially uh, identical. I mean, at, at this level of, 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 of analysis, all over the world. I've looked at stories from, you know, billions of places, thanks to this uh, 
the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which gives fantastic interlineal glosses of all kinds of languages because I wouldn't pretend to know any of them. But um, so we see essentially that this temporal or spatial, and I say this temporal, we essentially see what goes on, a, a, a timeline. There turn out to be some languages apparently which don't mark time, they're not interested in time, but they actually mark location. So you get temporal junctures. You basically get this happened in this location, and this happened in this location, and this happened in this location, while most uh, temporal-based uh, story traditions have this time, and this time, and this time. But still, what does it do? It creates essentially a main line. Uh, if you were basically just doing a discourse tree of it, you know, that would be your, if under my analysis, would, which is under some analysis of yours, that would be a coordination node with a bunch of different events giving you the main line. Um, they all basically tell you, give you information about the context, about the situation, about the uh, setting, about the characters. People just don't, you know, come in and shout, give three different events or five different, nothing stops you from doing that, you know. I mean, you can say anything you want, but people don't do that. They basically have event information and non-event information in the story world. Uh -huh. It's pretty from our perspective, they're nonlinear, okay? Because we're expecting a temporal linearity, and when we get a spatial linearity, we don't recognize it. Because that's what's funny, actually. I mean, I can just have a little digression from a linguistic point of view. Um, um, that um, if you look at you know many uh, studies of, of discourse particles. What you'll find is people saying things like, you know, these people basically, you know, I don't know what, you know, they don't mark, um, they don't mark tense, um, but they've got these funny particles they sort of throw around everywhere. We don't, you know, well, it turns out often that those particles are the things that basically um, uh, are giving you certain kinds of information. Okay, so for example, you have, you have languages that sort of keep on saying things which drive linguists who don't know this crazy, sort of saying, uh, in the same place, X, in the same place, Y, in the same place, Z. You say, why the hell don't they know it's in the same place? Why don't they inherit it like we do? But then they say, but they don't have time, okay? And then they'll suddenly say, in a different place. Well, that's, that's where the significance comes from. So it's nonlinear from our perspective, but it's not nonlinear if you think of it more abstractly. I think that that's um, uh, the point. And what you get here then is this evaluation where the key event changes the key state. Okay? And I just want to tell you a little story here about, um, which was very, it's a very sad story. It's the saddest, well, the second saddest data I ever looked at. The saddest data is the data from black boxes. But um, the second saddest is, is from, is Ishi. And I, perhaps some of you have read uh, uh, about Ishii. He was a, um, the last speaker of his language. Uh, he was a, 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 a northern, from a Northern California um, Native American tribe. Uh, and he was the last speaker of his language. And he lived his whole life with his sister and his grandparents. They were the only people he'd ever seen. His grandparents died, his sister died, and he was all alone. And eventually, he was found hiding uh, in some barn. And he was rescued by uh, Krober, who was a uh, famous anthropologist, um, who uh, uh, <clears throat> took, him, took him under his wig, wing to be an exhibit, I think, and to be essentially an informant about this language. And we actually have transcriptions of the stories that Ishii told to Krober. Um, and they are extraordinarily sad stories, okay? Now, why are they sad stories? Krober asked him to tell some of the native stories, you know, traditional stories from his culture, which he had been told, okay? And he tells the stories, okay? Uh, however, what's off and incredibly off is the evaluation structure. Because 
he'll have something like, you know, uh, you know, so then the guy, then, the, you know, whoever it is, the, the hero, you know, uh, made a flint arrow. And he will then spend 10 minutes telling you how to make a, a flint arrow. And then the mother went and ground the corn. Well, we get more about this corn, okay? Now, I've also read this exact same story told by a speaker from a slightly, a very related group. It's exactly the same Google and slight modification who grew up normally. And her stories are completely normal, okay? So she evaluates, at, you know, the event, and she evaluates the, the, the key durative description. He basically lingers just desperately and lovingly on the details of everyday life. So it's as if he was telling a story in which he sort of said, so then I, got, then I got out of the car, you know, one foot was there and then the next foot and then the next foot, and you're going, what's happening here? So it's not, you know, people can do whatever they want. So what's interesting, I think, about this and thinking about it at this level of generality is that we can do whatever we want when we do this, but what do we choose to do? And somehow what we choose to do is, is conventional. So that was just a, 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 a really um, sad story. Now clearly, okay, what a story is about is not universal.